Good evening and welcome to our program. My name is Adam Bain. I'm a member of the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church and the McClendon Scholar in Residence Council, which is the sponsor of tonight's program. We're so happy to have you here with us this evening. We have a very special program with Dr. Judy Fentress Williams, a pastor at the Alford Street Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia. I'll have more to say about Dr. Fentress Williams in a few minutes in introduction, but I wanna talk for just a minute about the mission of our program. The McClendon Scholar in Residence program brings scholars and thought leaders to Washington to share their learning, wisdom, and insight about how the church can be more effective in its work for social justice. The program was established through the generosity of Reverend Jack E. McClendon, who was an associate pastor of our church. It was his vision that God's call for social justice can be sustained when a community of faith grapples with the issues of the day. In the past, we have had great spiritual and social justice leaders speak with us. Our last program was with Jim Wallace, who spoke about the intersection of democracy and faith. The Reverend William Barber talked to us about redeeming the heart and soul of America. Karina Gore offered us a spiritual and moral response to the climate crisis. And Brian Stevenson talked to us about justice and mercy. Our past speakers have also included Senator Raphael Warnock, theologian Kelly Brown Douglas, and columnist E.J. Dion. And of course, tonight's speaker, Dr. Judy Fentress Williams, whom I believe is just our second or third repeat McClendon scholar. She so inspired us last year that we had to have her back. And the great news is that she will be with us multiple times over the course of this summer. Before I turn this program over to the director of our scholar in residence program, I'd like to offer a brief invocation. Dear God, as the events of your creation continue to unfold, we seek your clarity and your peace. We know that you are with us and for us when we gather together to seek your counsel. Scripture reminds us that the more we seek you, the more we will find you. We ask you to lead our surrendered hearts to the path of peace and justice today and every day. Amen. Theo? Thank you, Adam, um, and good evening. Uh, I want to add my welcome and just say how pleased we are that you're with us tonight for this McClendon Scholar Program. Most of you, I think, have been to one of our previous programs. We're glad to have you with us again. Uh, if you, this is your first time, I want to say a special welcome and hope you'll become a regular in attending our future webinars and other events. One of the good thing about the many webinars we've had uh, and conducted over the past two years is that it's allowed us to build up contacts of people all over the country. In addition to the many people from all over Washington, DC, um, who attended our last program, we had participants from more than 30 different states. I'm guessing there's some of that mixed audience again tonight, and it's always interesting to see where people are from. Uh, and so I invite you to do what someone, Kathleen Baden from Indianapolis already did, uh, and uh, Take a moment and type in the chat uh, who, where you are and who you are. And if you're with a particular organization or, or congregation, you may want to let us know that too. But it's always interesting to see where folks are. And I invite you to type that in chat over the next couple of minutes. Um, the chat function is uh, at the bottom. Most of you are probably familiar with webinars by now. Uh, and, and again, use chat, not uh, Q&A. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. And you can see... Uh, people coming in from all over the country. You might also mention whether you've heard Judy Fentress Williams before. I know many of you have, others may not have, and you're in for a treat uh, if you are new. You can see people from uh, Winchester, Virginia, from Maine, 
from Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, someone says that Judy is her former Hebrew teacher. So I'm uh, sure that, that person is delighted to hear her former professor tonight. Uh, you see the various places, Fremont, California, uh, so many different locations, uh, Rehoboth, Delaware. I've been wishing I was at Rehoboth, Delaware the last few hot days. Uh, and it's good to see where you all folks are from. And it really is a, 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 a uh, electronic community of people around the country. If we were in person, uh, we'd have you reach over and greet people and say hi, but we have to do it electronically and we appreciate you checking in uh, this way. Now, after having a dozen years worth of in-person programs, uh, two years ago by the pandemic, we were forced into webinars. Uh, we are going to be having other programs in person, but webinars are going to be a, a part of what we do going forward. We found them to be successful in so many ways. I remember almost exactly two years ago today, we had our first webinar. And the McClendon Scholar that day was Dr. Judy Fentress Williams. She was our very first webinar. And I remember how nervous we all were, me in particular, uh, and we practiced and rehearsed. And I was afraid that the technology was gonna fail, but fortunately everything went fine with the webinar. And she was so well received that as uh, Adam said, we had her back again last year, and now we've made these arrangements to have her with us multiple times as a summer scholar in residence. Uh, she'll be with us two more times. And at the end of the program, I'll share that those dates and information about when you can hear her again uh, as part of her being with us uh, during the summer. As you know, uh, Dr. Fentress Williams will be lecturing tonight on the intriguing topic of Abraham and the multiverse. And after that, we will have some time to ask some questions and engage in discussion with her. Now, I'm not sure how many times the words Abraham and multiverse have been used in the same title, but I have a feeling it isn't very many times. And we look forward to Judy's exploration of that topic. Now, during the program, during as she speaks and in our discussion later, We'll keep both the chat and the question functions open. Again, if you're not familiar with Zoom, they're at the bottom on the row, uh, they're at the very bottom of the various functions. Uh, but now take note of the difference between them. Um, for chat, it's for comments, it's for sharing resources. We may put a couple of links and resources in there. If you have observations or things you wanna share, and then there's the question function, and please save that just for questions. As Judy talks, if there's a, something you want her to say more about or clarify or a particular question that comes up, write that in as a question uh, in the Q&A, and Adam and I will be monitoring these questions, um, and we will select some to ask Judy later on and to bring into the conversation. We'll, we'll do that as long as we have time to do so um, after her uh, presentation. So I wanna say again, how pleased we are to have you join us. Um, we look forward to the program and I uh, wanna turn things back to Adam uh, who will introduce our McClendon Scholar for the evening. Thanks, Theo. As you've probably gotten the idea already. We're very excited to have uh, Dr. Judy Fentress Williams here again with us this evening. Um, in addition to her duties, as a pastor at the Alfred Street Baptist Church, where she focuses on Christian education. She is a professor of Old Testament at the Virginia Theological Seminary, where she specializes in the Hebrew Bible, Afro-American studies, and literary criticism. She is a prolific scholar with numerous publications, including most recently, Holy Imagination, a literary and theological interpretation of the whole Bible. And there you see the cover in front of you right now. It's been touted as an engaging and accessible interpretation of the Bible. And it's available on Amazon and at many other sites. And I think that that's just been put into the chat so you can easily uh, go and see it and order it. I'm sure you will want to after you hear Dr. Fentress Williams speak this evening. 
Dr. Fentress Williams went to Princeton University and Yale Divinity School. During her career, she has received numerous academic and teaching awards and honors, and you will soon understand why. Dr. Fentress Williams, thank you so much for agreeing to be here with us again this evening to enlighten us with your wisdom and insight. Thank you, Adam. And good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction. Thank you to the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church for this invitation. It is an honor to be a part of the McClendon Scholars Program. And as someone who is raised in the Presbyterian Church, it always feels like a homecoming of sorts to be with you all. And it is important in these days that we have the space to have um, dialogue um, that involves scholarship and faith and social justice. So thank you. The title for tonight's lecture, Abraham and the Multiverse, is going to examine the character of Abraham. We're going to focus tonight on Genesis chapter 18 and think about his multiple roles in the story. And we're going to use the lens of internal family systems theory. I'm interested in how our study of the character of Abraham can contribute to our understanding of God's call on our lives. Now, if this sounds like an ambitious topic to you, I think you are right. The work that I'm sharing with you tonight is a work in progress. I have the long-term goal of completing a commentary on the book of Genesis, and I look forward to your response to what I'm trying out right now. Now, before we get to the Bible, let me say a little bit about my approach to scripture. I use as my primary methodology, dialogic criticism, which begins with the premise that the Bible is inherently a dialogical text. I say this all the time to my students, before you open the Bible, there's already a party going on. In other words, we believe that there are many voices in scripture and that these many voices contribute um, to an ongoing conversation. And I think that one of the things this conversation is focused on is identity. In other words, what does it mean to be the people of God across time and in different spaces? I think the dialogue we see in scripture is not only based on those who have collected biblical stories and traditions, but this conversation involves those of us who interact with scripture today. So if you think about the fact that the Bible is engaged in a conversation before it begins, when we open this text and begin to read, we enter into that conversation with our own experiences, our own contexts, and our own lenses. And this adds to this ongoing conversation that is constantly creating theological meaning. Some of the principles of dialogic criticism are as follows. One is that dialogic truth requires uh, multiple consciousnesses. In other words, you can't get all of the truth in your head by yourself, that the truth is larger than an individual. And so this work is best done in community. A dialogic approach is going to focus on events rather than system. I love this because in my experience, the Bible is just squirrely or messy. In other words, every time we think we have a system to explain the Bible, we go to the next verse and it blows the whole thing out of the water. So perhaps instead of trying to make the Bible fit into a system, we should pay attention to the events in scripture as they unfold. Another characteristic of dialogic criticism is connected to this concept of event. And the term here that I'm going to use is chronotope. Chronotope is a term from science that means time space. And I'll explain it a little bit more later in the lecture. And the final characteristic of dialogic truth that I want to raise tonight is that of unfinalizability. This is one of my favorites. It means that the truth of the Bible 
is constantly unfolding before us that as long as we live, there will be more to discover in scripture. I think this approach is well suited to the Bible because when we read scripture, we often find multiple, sometimes even conflicting accounts. If you read the Bible, sometimes you'll read a story and really important details will be missing. You might start in one story and all of a sudden another story just puts itself in the middle of your narrative flow. And in my experience, chronology is kind of optional in the Bible. So using these principles of dialogic criticism, we can better navigate scripture and celebrate the symphony of voices, looking for the events or the chronotope in the story and celebrating the fact that we'll never have all the truths that scripture has for us. As the title suggests tonight, we're going to look at the character of Abraham. So in the book of Genesis, we have two basic parts. Genesis 1 to 11 is what we call the primeval or primordial history. These are the origin stories of all of us. These are universal in scope and I would say mythic in proportion. When we get to Genesis chapter 12, we have a shift into what we call the ancestral materials. And this is where we start to focus on a specific family as opposed to the whole universe. And this begins with a collection of units that we call the Abraham cycle. And all of that begins in Genesis chapter 12, one, where we read as follows. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will make your name great and I will bless you so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's how the ancestral materials begin. And the Abraham cycle starts in 12 and ends with the patriarch's death in chapter 25, 11. The promise that we just read about in Genesis 12 is what we call a threefold promise. God promises land, descendants, and blessings. But we hear these three pieces and we want to focus on how the story um, moves us toward the fulfillment of each of those three pieces. The collection of materials around Abraham from chapter 12 to 25 are a number of narrative units that have been collected and combined. So the stories follow Abram, who then becomes Abraham after he responds to God's call. And he's living out his life as a semi-nomad from place and staying in place and then going to another place and staying for a while, moving from place to place as he is seeking the realization of God's promise. Walter Brueggemann will tell you that these narrative units are not easily contained in any one scheme. So think about what I said about dialogic criticism, the event rather than system. It's hard to have come up with a system um, that can explain how the collection of Abraham's stories works. All right, they're not easily contained in a theme, which means that the arrangement may or may not be um, chronological. Um, and we can discern patterns in this material, but there may not be a single or definitive pattern. However, these units do give us a testimony to Abram and Abraham's formation. Abraham's growth as he lives into the fulfillment of God's promise. Now, in the absence of a chronology in the Abraham story, I'm going to appeal to chronotope. Now, chronotope is this concept that I mentioned earlier, and it comes originally from the field of science and means time space. But in the literary work of dialogic criticism, Chronotope is the moment in the story that stands out from all the other moments. 
it is described as the peg upon which the narrative hangs. Another way of thinking of chronotope is as the organizing center of a narrative. So if we have this collection of materials that may not be chronological, what are we looking for? The notion of chronotope helps us to think about looking for the narrative pegs or the turning points in this story. So now let's think about that as we look at this Abraham material. We're following the life of Abraham, a semi-nomad whose itinerary is interrupted, if you will, by these encounters with God. Abraham is doing the thing he's supposed to do, taking care of his family, feeding his sheep, and then God shows up. All right, he is attending to the stuff of life. God comes and makes big promises with grand gestures. And then God leaves. And Abraham is left to figure out what to do about that big moment in the living out of his everyday life. So what did God's promise mean in the face of hostile neighbors or family strife or infertility or age? How do God's promises make themselves manifest in Abraham's daily existence? If we think about this with chronotope, it means that every time God shows up, every theophany is a kind of come to Jehovah moment. And it's a check-in. How is Abraham progressing with his own journey to fully receive the promises of God in his daily life? We have this external movement of Abraham as a semi-nomad, but with these theophanies, we have this moment to think about Abraham's internal journey, the one that he is undergoing so that he can become a recipient of these amazing promises that God has made. They are the pegs upon which the story hangs. Let me say this another way. From a faith perspective, there is never a question as to whether or not God will fulfill God's promise. From a faith perspective, God's promise is secure. And if that's the case, then the narrative is not concerned with God's part of the promise. Rather, it is concerned with Abraham's ability to receive God's promise. So if the narrative is about Abraham's journey to the promise, we may have a better understanding of the language in God's initial call to Abraham in Genesis 12.1. Those first two words that open that passage in Hebrew are lech, lecha. First two words consist of a second person masculine singular imperative from the verb halak. So that first word lech means you, go. All right, you second person masculine singular, you guy, you go. The second word in this command, lacha, is a preposition, which is the letter L or a lamed, that signifies to, for, or in regard to. They've got the preposition with a second person masculine singular pronoun. Stay with me. So the first word is you go. And then the second word we tried it, we can translate as um, this is you, you really go, you, you go for yourself, you go regarding yourself, you go as concerns yourself. In these options, that second word is emphasis, emphasizing the first word, you go, yes, you, you go, all right? But there's another option available to us because that preposition, that L or that Lamed, can signify two. It is possible that what the command is in Genesis 12.1 is you go, go to yourself. Go to yourself. So it raises the possibility that the journey upon which Abraham embarks is both external and internal. In this sense, every encounter with God is a checkup on his spiritual development, his own wholeness. And whenever God shows up, there's this incursion of this heavenly realm 
into this other space where Abraham lives. And this is the moment where alternate realities in the multiverse come together. So I want to say a little bit about the multiverse as something that exists in science and then science fiction. Here's the moment where I need to confess that as an undergraduate, I took physics for poets. So I'm going to say very little about this in a scientific manner. The science, the multiverse in simple terms is the proposition that beyond our known universe, there are other universes and other realities that exist as well. This scientific concept gets picked up by science fiction and fantasy, and we see it in comic books as characters in these fictional accounts encounter parallel universes where anything is possible. For Superman, there's a bizarre world in which everything in that alternate universe is the exact opposite or almost the exact opposite of what happens in this world. Most recently, um, there's been the release of a, mo a movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe um, called Doctor Strange in the Multiverse. Now, if you're not a comic book fan, give me two minutes and then I promise I'll leave it alone. So in this latest movie, we have a superhero or a wizard by the name of Stephen Strange. And the whole point of the movie is that he has to subdue the chaos that threatens our world because of the incursion of other universes. And so he assembles some folks to help him in the process of moving from one universe to another while, while he tries to correct this thing. He has to reckon with the reality that in some universes, in some contexts, he is actually the bad guy. He's the threat to the world. And as he moves from universe to universe, this character has to confront not only different iterations of the world, but different iterations of himself. Every time he goes to another universe, he has to achieve the same task, even with different circumstances. He has to stop the advances of the Scarlet Witch but he also has to deal with his own failings in the process. At the beginning of the movie, a line is delivered to him. You always have to be the one holding the knife. Dr. Strange was a surgeon. And part of what he learns in this movie is that in order to be successful, he can not only stop the bad force out there, but that he himself has to change. Each time he goes to another universe, he has an opportunity to, um, to change his approach so that he can not only save the day, but realize that he has to um, do his own work of redemption by letting go of his need to control everything. I think that was my two minutes. Please stay with me here because I see a correspondence between what happens in those multiverses and the theophanies in the Abraham cycle. Every time God appears, Abraham has the opportunity to try to live into this big promise that God has made. God appears and is reiterating or interpreting the process. And with each appearance, Abraham struggles to receive it. He has to, to go into himself as instructed in the command, Leif Lecha. And I think this stretching out to receive God's promise is a part of his formation as he forms a new identity. God calls Abram or Abraham in chapter 12 and appears and speaks to him again in chapter 13. God makes another appearance in chapter 15 and another one in chapter 17, chapter 18, chapters 21 and 22. So let's think about that. The Abraham cycle begins in chapter 12 and goes to chapter 25, 11. And God shows up in chapters 13, 15, 17, 18, 21, and 22. In chapter 13, God shows up 
after Abraham separates from Lot. And God makes the promise in chapter 13 that Abraham's descendants will be like the dust of the earth. In chapter 15, God appears again, and this time promises that Abraham's descendants will be like the stars in the sky. In chapter 17, God appears and reaffirms the covenant that he made with Abram and changes his name to Abraham and changes Sarai's name to Sarah. In chapter 18, the Lord appears to Abraham in the form of three visitors. In 21, God tells Abraham that it is all right to follow Sarah's um, insistence to send Hagar away because God has plans to make Ishmael a great nation. And in 22, God commands Abraham to sacrifice his son, Isaac. So let's take a moment and think about these theophanies as um, chronotope or as turning points in the narrative. Although there is not a definitive pattern in the Abraham cycle, we can detect some patterns. In fact, these appearances of God kind of look like doublets or pairs. Think about it. God's promise in chapter 13 and chapter 15 both speak to the number of Abraham's descendants. Chapter 13, they'll be like the sand. Chapter 15, they will be like the stars in the sky, both beyond count. Those two promises about the number of Abraham's descendants appear before chapter 16 with the birth of Ishmael. Chapter 17 and chapter 18 can be connected because they both include the element of laughter. In chapter 17, Abraham laughs. In chapter 18, Sarah laughs. And 17 and 18 are a prelude to the birth of their son, Isaac, which means laughter. And then if you think about chapters 21 and chapter two, they can be classified as a pair in that they are both texts that we consider threat to the promise passages. In chapter 21, Ishmael is sent away. In chapter 22, God instructs Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. In these three pairs of appearances, we see a common thread that's attached to the birth of Abraham's sons, Ishmael and Isaac, and, um, and then the threat to both of them. Without the birth and survival of Isaac and arguably Ishmael, Abraham cannot realize God's promise. Each of these theophanies then creates an alternate reality or universe in which Abraham has to adapt to respond to the promise of God in the hopes that one day he will be able to fully receive it. So for the purposes of our time together this evening, I now want to focus on the theophany in Genesis 18. And it stands out from the others because of the way God shows up and because of the interaction with Sarah. So I'm going to read Genesis chapter 18 verses 1 through 15 and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. 
Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I have grown old and my husband old, shall I be fruitful? But, or shall I have pleasure is another way of saying that. And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied saying, I did not laugh for she was afraid. He said, yes, you did laugh. So let's make a few observations. God's appearance this time is different from the others. This time, there are three men who come upon the encampment of Abraham. And the only reason we know it is the Lord is because the narrator tells us so. Upon their arrival, Abraham goes into action, extending the laws of hospitality. Now we should pause here for a moment to say that hospitality is not simply a courtesy, but that in the harsh reality of a semi-nomadic life in the wilderness, hospitality is about survival. In the ancient Near East, there was a code amongst Bedouins to feed and protect the strangers from the harsh surroundings. It is also the case that sometimes a stranger would offer a gift or um, some kind of favor as an expression of gratitude to the host. So presented with the arrival of the three men, Abraham knows exactly what to do. Note the sequence of action. Abraham rushes out to meet them. He bows down. He invites the guests to stop and rest. His haste to be hospitable is reflected in his commands and the actions of his wife, Sarah, and the servant. He ran to the guests to welcome them, and then he rushed to Sarah and the servant, and then he ran to the guests to welcome them, um, and then um, tells Sarah to go and make cakes. Then he runs to the herd. He took an animal, handed it over to the servant that hastened to prepare it. So pay attention to all of the verbs around haste. But also know that for all the hurrying in this passage, we know that the preparation of an animal takes quite a bit of time. So there's this tension between all the hurrying and the amount of time it takes from the moment the guests arrive until they are actually fed. We literally have a hurry up and wait situation. And we also observe that although Abraham is in the role of host, he is not doing all of this work. Instead, he kind of functions as the front man, greeting and extending hospitality while Sarah and the servants do the work of preparing the feast. He then is given the role of presenting the meal, the calf prepared by the servant, curds and milk, and places it before the visitors. I'd like to think of this moment like the carving of the turkey at Thanksgiving. In many American household traditions, the patriarch of the house carves the turkey, whether or not he prepared it, performing a ceremonial role. Abraham presides over the meal in that way. And Sarah is in place 
within the tent and out of sight when we hear the visitors speak again. And this time they issue a question, where is your wife, Sarah? So let's assume for the moment that everything that has taken place so far has happened according to plan. Abraham has functioned in his role properly, as have Sarah and the servant. Everyone has fulfilled their role. If that is the case, then the question that comes to Abraham is a bit out of order. Does a stranger inquire of the host's wife? No, I don't think so. And how does a stranger even know her name? In the hierarchical construct of the Middle East, does she belong in this conversation at all? Or is she exactly where she should be, behind the tent flap, as Abraham indicates, out of sight, but in earshot in the event that the guests need something? If this overture is inappropriate, it's not over. Because now the text tells us one, one of the guests makes a promise. I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. Now, although the conversation at this point is about Sarah or includes Sarah, she is not a part of it. And so Sarah is engaged in a conversation with herself. She's engaged in an internal conversation. The Bible tells us that she laughs to herself and asks a question of herself. After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? Now here's where it gets interesting. God speaks, or this visitor, speaks to Abraham about Sarah. Sarah speaks to herself. And now the visitor, who is now the Lord, responds to Sarah's internal conversation by speaking to Abraham, who did not hear Sarah's response. The Lord's response to Sarah's question is with another question. Why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? And then another question, is anything too wonderful for the Lord? Two questions followed by a promise. At the set time, I will return to you. In due season, Sarah shall have a son. Now Sarah responds with a denial of her laughter and the Lord counters, oh yes, you did laugh. So the exchange begins with one of the visitors asking Abraham about Sarah. And over the course of this dialogue, we go from one of the visitors talking to Abraham and ending with the Lord speaking to Sarah. Is Sarah still behind the tent flap by the end of the conversation? What are we to make of the fact that after Abraham gives Sarah's location, he is no longer the center or the only person to whom this exchange is directed, but now she is. I want to point out two movements in the unit. One is the identity of the visitors. Three men appear. They speak in verse five, accepting Abraham's hospitality. They asked about Sarah's location in verse nine. In verse 10, one speaks. In verse 13, the speaker is the Lord. So there are a lot of ways to address the discrepancies. Here's where we want to acknowledge the presence of different traditions that are combined into this narrative. But a literary reading is going to see a pattern in the final form of a text that shows that the identity of the speaker moves from vague to specific, from multiple to one, and correspondingly, as the identity of the speaker comes into focus, so does the person to whom the promise is directed. In this hierarchical world, the Lord messages Sarah. 
first through Abraham, and then directly about her laughter at the Lord's promise. Before the promise of a child is fulfilled, the Lord has an encounter with Sarah. This is the second movement in the unit, from Abraham, the head of the household, to Sarah standing behind the tent. So there's a movement from multiple visitors to the Lord and a movement from Abraham to Sarah. I've long been intrigued with the positioning of Sarah, the matriarch in this story, and I've been curious about her laughter. Her laughter is a natural response because everything she says is true. She has, in her own words, grown old, and her husband is old. I love the difference. Abraham's already old. It sounds like she just got there, all right? But her question is, so how am I to have pleasure? This word for grown old is withered or dried up, and the word for pleasure means abundant moisture, the opposite of her current state. This word for pleasure is the root for Eden, as in Garden of Eden, the Garden of Delights. So she laughs both at the possibility of bearing a child and the possibility of the kind of pleasure that would produce one. If Eden is pleasure, then Sarah is the embodiment of the wilderness. And she has as, as slim a chance of getting back to um, Eden as Adam and Eve did in chapter three of Genesis. We want to just be mindful of the fact that Sarah is not the only one that laughs. Abraham laughed at the promise of God in Genesis chapter 17, 17. The text says Abraham threw himself on his face and laughed as he said to himself, can a child be born to a man 100 years old or can Sarah bear a child at 90? And in response to Abraham's laughter, God simply repeats what he has promised before, that God will keep his promise. I think the exchange with Sarah is different. And I think that the difference is in Sarah's laughter and in the response that we witness. And that that laughter and the response that we witness is a turning point in the narrative. So to make this final point, I want to invite you to consider another lens and that's the lens of internal family systems theory. Now, some of you may be familiar with family systems theory through the work of Edwin Friedman and his application to family systems, particularly in um, institutions, in congregations. Internal family systems is the work of people like Richard Schwartz and Martha Sweezy that is interested in the multiple sub-personalities in an individual. The premise here is that we are made up of a number of parts or sub personalities that coexist. We have the part of us that presents itself to the world, but there are other parts of us that hold fear or hurt or shame from early experiences. And these parts continue to carry the emotions and the memories associated with those experiences. The outward facing part is called the manager. The manager's job is to control surroundings, manage emotions, and navigate daily life. Thus, the parts that carry our painful memories and emotion, I'm sorry, but the parts that carry our painful memories and emotions, that part is known as the exile. When those hurt parts, the exile, erupts from its designated place, then what occurs is described as a firefight. I love that language of exile. Might we say that one way to consider the narrative in Genesis 18 is through the lens of internal family systems theory and that the characters of Abraham, Sarah, and to a lesser extent, the servant are all parts of Abraham. In this story, then, Abraham is the manager, managing the situation, standing in his role as patriarch and extending the invitation, ordering Sarah and the servant to do their work in the background as he functions as the ceremonial head of the family and the recipient of God's promise. His hurried behavior includes his orders to Sarah and the servant so that he can present the feast. And in the story, 
Um, and in this, in internal family systems theory, I mean, and in this story, Sarah, as the infertile wife, is the carrier of the hurt, fear, and shame. Her body, not that of Abraham's, is the reminder of barrenness. And so she stands behind the tent flap, hidden, perhaps symbolizing the place that we assign to our own disappointments and fear and shame. If, I'm sorry, in, eternal, in internal family systems, it's the job of the manager to keep the exiles contained and hidden from conscious awareness to avoid distress and pain. But in this story, the Lord circumvents Abraham the manager to get to Sarah the exile and confront her with a promise. If we see Sarah as a part of the shame that Abraham carries around and tries to hide, then we see that the Lord will not allow it to remain hidden. In fact, if we now look at the overall movement of the story, the promise of the child will not be realized until Sarah is called out from behind the tent flap. The encounter in this part of Genesis chapter 18 is shaped so that the vague references to the um, three visitors becomes the Lord and the other two people become attendants and angels alongside the invitation to Abraham's hidden pieces to become integrated. And laughter is the action around which all of this happens. It's Sarah's laughter that carries the pain of being withered and the shame of her embodiment in the face of God's promise. The promise is Eden and she is the wilderness. And her honesty in this moment seems to function as the opening into which God asks the question to end all questions. Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? The word for wonderful here, pala, means surpassing, extraordinary, difficult, wonder. The question is an invitation to Sarah's imagination. In other words, the invitation to imagination is issued to the part of us that carries hurt and shame. The invitation to exercise faith comes to the parts that are hidden away. Such an invitation reminds me of Paul Ricoeur's statement about Abraham as a person of great faith. He said Abraham was able to accept God's invitation to promise because he had a great imagination. And he went on to say that imagination was the precursor to faith. Our imagination fills the spaces and gaps that we cannot see. And if this is the case, the question that is addressed to Sarah has a function of a call. Perhaps we can call this chapter the call of Sarah. With the lens of internal family systems as a chronotope in the narrative of the cycle of Abraham, we could argue that the fulfillment of the promise regarding Isaac cannot happen without Sarah. And by this, I mean both the character Sarah and I also mean Sarah as she represents a part of Abraham. Abraham's growth to receive the promise of God depends on his integration of all the parts of him, particularly the parts he has exiled. The call of God to Abraham is a call to wholeness. And this is what is meant in the words lech lecha, go, go to yourself or to all of yourselves. So coming out of this, I have three observations and one question, and here they are. First observation, an internal, an internal family systems reading offers a theological observation, namely that God will not call us to a thing without calling us to wholeness. Perhaps the thing standing between us and our realization of God's work in our lives is not out there, but internal to us. I want to say that again. 
sometimes the thing that stands between us and our realization of God's work in our lives is not external, but internal. That's the first observation. Second observation is the theophanies in the Abraham cycle are, are, cycle are reminders of the alternate universes and realities we are reminded of when we encounter the divine. And like Abraham, it is our obligation to grow in such a way that we can live in more than one space or one reality. I said I had two observations and one, I, I said I had three observations and one question. I think I have two observations and two questions. So those are my two observations. Here's my first question. Does the movement towards Abraham's integration in the first part of Genesis 18 explain the confident character that we see who bargains with God in the second part of this chapter. Um, Abraham is extremely um, self-possessed and intent in the second half of this chapter. And is it because this character is more integrated than the one with which we began in chapter 18? And another question I have is how might the lens of family systems external family systems and internal family systems inform our reading of Genesis chapter 19, the story of Lot and his family in Sodom and Gomorrah. I think that in the same way that we can think of 17 and 18 as pairs, I think we can think of 18 and 19 as pairs as well that we can read. And so those are two of the questions that I have coming out of this work. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. You've given us a lot to think about. And uh, we've got a few minutes to talk. And uh, I have some questions to start us off. And then I think perhaps from others. And I invite you, if you have a very specific question on something she said, or you'd like her to clarify, uh, or a broader question about the story of uh, Abraham and Sarah you'd like to ask. Uh, type it into the Q&A uh, box uh, right now. Um, so many things, I have some questions, I guess, about the broader things you said about interpreting scripture, as well as some things in the story. I guess I'd like to start by you commenting a little bit more about how uh, this is about both the external and internal journey of Abraham. And I really like the phrase you said about, he's trying to live into the big promise yeah. God has made. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe say a little bit more about that and where you see that in the story. Yeah, I just love when you look at the Abraham story, you know, it's like God shows up and, you know, I call it the big show, you know, look at the stars, Abraham, or so, something amazing happens. And then God goes away and Abraham is still old and he still doesn't have a son. And so there's this sense in which there he's got to figure out how to take that moment and, and adjust or live in such a way that he is mindful of this other reality. I think that's a wonderful um, image of what it is to live a life of faith. Any other um, um, guidance for us in that or how we, <laughs> how, you know, any lessons here about how we live into the big promise of God that you see in that you point to? Yeah, I mean, I think this is where this idea of a multiverse is so useful that we can learn a lot about God, I think, through science fiction. But remembering that whatever we see or whatever we experience is not all that there is to reality. And it should not be lost on us that people who are in really difficult circumstances, people who are oppressed, are very good at looking for another realm, another plane. Um, we need to be mindful that whatever our experience is, is not the only experience, which means um, not only that the promises of God might be realized when we think about another reality, but we might learn about the promises of God when we engage in conversation with people who are different from us. You, you um, explained and talked about that very interesting, almost circuitous conversation with the three and Sarah. Uh, um, and I, I never heard it explained or talked about in that way. Say a little bit more, how, what's the significance of how that communication happens that you'd want us to remember? Yeah, so there are a couple of ways to explain this and an easy way to explain it might simply be 
this story represents a number of different traditions. And in one tradition, it's three beings, and in another tradition, it's one. And so that is clearly um, a, an interpretation that takes into account the fact that the Bible comes to us from a variety of different sources. And that's a legitimate one. But I also think what a literary approach does is acknowledge that, but then say, based on what we have in this final form, um, what are we to make of that movement? And I just love the fact that by the end, it is the Lord and it's the Lord talking to Sarah. And so it may not have been clear in the beginning who showed up, but it's clear at the end. And that in this final form, whether it was intentional or not, we get this image of this increasing clarity as Abraham spends time in the presence of the divine. Um. Um, of course, at the core of the whole story is the call. Yeah. And, you know, when we read this story, it's a very familiar story, much of it. Um, the call seems so clear to Abraham. Yeah. Um, sometimes we listen for the call. It's not quite so clear. We're trying to decide, is that the call of God or is that something else? Are there lessons <laughs> in the story here that we can measure our own sense of trying to understanding what God's call is? Yeah, I do think that anyone who has experienced God's call has also experienced confusion or doubt about that call. Um, and this is this other dynamic we see with Abraham where he has this great moment and then God is gone. Um, so what is it to have an encounter with God that is so powerful and so real and then not feel it? And there is, um, I think in this Abraham story, the theophany and then back to regular life, the theophany and back to regular life, that that's the pattern that we see in so many other places in the Bible, this kind of God's presence and God's absence. And I feel as though in some senses, this is what it means to be a human being, that we know what it is to feel God's presence. And if you've experienced that, you also know the tremendous longing that comes when we don't. You used the term, um... First of all, I want to make sure I understood what it was in terms of interpretation. Chronotope, did I get that right? And, yeah, you did. and how do you spell it? And tell us a little about that word. And, and uh, yeah. it's the moment that stands out in a story from all others, as I heard you say. That's right. What are some of the chronotopes then in, yeah. the, in the story you just told? Yeah. So chronotope is spelled C H. R-O-N-O-T-O-P-E. Um, so think of chronology or chronos, um, chronotope, and it literally means time space. It's the, it's the moment where everything comes together. So I, I used to describe it as moment with a capital M. And then I remember someone asking me, is this kind of like chronos and kairos in Greek? And I said, yes, you can think of it that way. But it's, it's how we build a story. So remember, if we can't rely on chronology in scripture, it's not, the story's not laid out, this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened, because sometimes scripture is gonna give us this account and then it's gonna backtrack and give us this account. Where is the order or what are we looking for? Um, chronotope is the structure or the framework. And I think, in the story of Abraham, the structure and the framework comes to us in the theophanies. God calls in the beginning and God keeps showing up and God keeps saying that, that thing I said, it's gonna happen. It's really gonna happen. It's gonna be great. And so that would be the moments, those are the moments that structure the story. And then what we see in between would be Abraham's responses. So you could almost think about the story of Abraham as a story of call and response. The other themes um, is the, the, the issue of risk. And <laughs> I, I know you mentioned this in your book when you write a little about this, uh, this particular section of Genesis. Uh, is risk inherent in answering a call in a certain way? What would you say about risk and, and, and this story? Well, in my experience, it certainly has been. <laughs> I mean, if we, if we follow this, this 
idea down the road that this call that God makes on our lives is not just about what we do, but who we become, then there's this risk of vulnerability. Um, there's a risk of change. Um, I mean, God's call to Abram was leave your identity behind for a new one. And that feels really risky to me. But it's not just external events they're called to do. You're making the point that and I love your phrase. It's, it's a call to wholeness. Yes. Uh, it's not just a call to get take up your stuff and go to another town. That's it's, right. It's this internal call. I, and I, I find that very helpful the way you unpack that a little bit. Well, think about people in leadership in the church who are the walking wounded. Um, and everyone can think of someone. And, you, you know, we realize that when God calls us, part of the work that God is calling us to is to make sure that we ourselves are whole, that, that that's as much a part of our work as what we're doing externally. The other terms you used, and I, uh, again, I, 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 I like it and I'm probably going to use it, but I don't know if this is a real word, uh, unfinalizability. Yes, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, I, I, just say more about that in scripture yeah. that, you know, there, um, um, I, I was taught growing up to interpret scripture as this fixed thing in the past that we needed to understand. And yeah. you're saying something very different there about yeah. it's unfinalizable. And just yeah. say a little more about what you mean by that. Yeah. So the word unfinalizability is the, tr the English translation of a Russian word. So the, the method I use, dialogic criticism, is um, informed by um, uh, Mikhail Bakhtin's work and dialogic criticism. And so the word doesn't exist in English. Um, we translate it from a Russian word, but I do believe it speaks beautifully to the truth of scripture, that God's word um, is not, um, it's not dead, it's alive, it's still speaking, it's still making meaning. And our interaction with scripture is how meaning is understood or realized. Um, so an example that I've used, and I don't know if I've used it here, is um, um, Rembrandt's painting of the, the, the near sacrifice of Isaac was this very famous painting that he did that shows um, Abraham, you know, with arm drawn back, ready to um, plunge the knife into the child, um, the angel is holding his hand and you see the knife dropping. Um, when he painted that before he had children, when he, after he had children, he returned to that subject. And it was from his perspective as a father that he had a different understanding of what that might've looked like. And in a sketch he did, which I love, you see Abraham holding Isaac um, covering his eyes, shielding him from what's about to happen. And the angel is behind Abraham. So this different image of God treating us in the same way Abraham is treating Isaac, so that our understanding or our interpretation can change over time. There are a number of other um, of questions some people have sent in. Um, I know uh, I've looked at them a little. I think Adam has been looking at them. Let's see, Adam, have you got a couple of questions you want to share based on some that uh, have been typed into the uh, question box? Sure. We've gotten a lot of great questions. Uh, your talk has really got a lot of people thinking, uh, Dr. Ventress Williams. Uh, Melanie Aaron writes in, years ago, a professor at Princeton Theological Seminary taught the second half of this chapter as a test of obedience that Abraham failed. But I hear you seeing Abraham asking God, shall not the judge of all the earth do justice <laughs> as an expression of a more fully developed Abraham. Can you talk more about that arguing with God? Sure. I have no idea who the professor at Princeton was, and I don't know what the context of that statement was. So it's hard for me to kind of respond to it just as it's presented to you. 
as it's presented to me. And as someone who was an undergraduate at Princeton, I don't want to speak against anyone who I may know um, and have great respect for. But I will say this. Um, I think that there, I think what I want to say is that Abraham is bolder in the second part of the chapter. And that's the observation I wanted to make, that he is, um, he keeps going. So I would say that the Abraham in the second part of the chapter is bolder than the Abraham in the first part of the chapter. Okay. Okay. And we have a couple questions from Solomon Parker uh, Palmer asking about uh, maybe some relationship to, to principles from the New Testament, such, such as could the three visitors be symbolic of the Trinity and what role might the Holy Spirit be playing in informing our understanding of the story of Abraham? So, yes, I think Christians would, uh, whenever Christians see three, the Christians go, yes, Trinity. Um, so if you're asking, could it be? Yes, it could be. Um, but the other thing I would want to say is be mindful that the writers of this material were not espousing um, a theology or doctrine of the Trinity. So it is, we need to be open to other possibilities as well. Um, the other question around what role does the Holy Spirit play in informing our understanding? Well, I, I hope the Holy Spirit has a role in how we understand the story. I believe that um, we are called to do our best work, um, to bring our best to the table, um, to, do, to study, to use all the resources that are available to us in critical study of the text, and that that effort is supported by the Holy Spirit. We have a few other questions. Um, and this, I think you may have touched on this as part of your talk, but what, what is your reading or the way that you've uh, interpreted this story say about those who were uh, the authors of the story? Um. Let's see, I'm trying to find that question. What does it's, my reading say about the one or ones who penned the chapter? Um, my reading of the story is based on um, what I believe to be the fact um, that the Bible that we have that is written comes to us from oral traditions multiple oral traditions that have been held and curated and preserved that what biblical writers and the curators of biblical materials did was hold on to all the traditions to the diversity of voices and so that is what i describe as the inherent um, dialogical nature of scripture I hope that answers the question. Uh, we have a question from John Quinn about uh, your interpretation being intriguing and he's wondering how much of it is a result of, of your imagination and how much of it is based on your scholarship or study of the Hebrew language. So let me, so, well, I hope <laughs> it's based on all these things. Let me say this, um, I do not know of any work in scholarship or elsewhere that does not engage in an imaginative framework. So one of the things that I really try to do in my work is get people to move away from this idea that imagination is a flight of fancy and then there's real hardcore work. That the real hardcore work of scholars is always about wondering because we don't have everything. So when I was talking about a method of interpretation earlier where I said, you do all of the work, um, this is what I mean, that um, careful analysis of the text, translation of the text, attention to possibilities. So that when I look at Lake Lecha, one of the things I have to do before I tell you what it might possibly mean is tell you all the other options. That's doing due diligence in work. But when I talk about an imaginative framework, what I mean is that every person, scholar or otherwise, 
um, brings questions to the text based on their own context, based on their own understanding of the text. There is no such thing as an objective reading. So it's important for everyone to say, here is my context and here's my methodology and this is how I did my work. And I think that's one of the ways we want to encourage people to do work. When I was in seminary, I would read books that said things like, well, clearly, well, but when I examined it closely, it wasn't clear. Um, so that we want to make sure that we are being honest about that. There are things we know and there are things we don't know. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. And I know that uh, a quick reading of this, uh, I, can, I can say personally, for those people who uh, have struggled with infertility in their lives, it can, be a, it can be a tough story, as many are in the Bible. So I appreciate your giving us different lenses through which to read stories like this. Yeah. Um, and I think I'm going to, well, I have another one here from G. Radford that says, I've always wondered about the difference between Abraham and Sarah's laughter. Why is Sarah's laughter within herself worthy of admonishment, but Abraham who laughed out loud receives no correction? Yeah, and see, I'm not sure it's admonishment. So Sarah laughs, if you look at the text, um, here's the way it goes. Um, um, let me just look at, get it, make sure I get it right here. Um, so Sarah, um, Sarah laughs to herself. Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? That's not admonishment necessarily. That's just a question, right? Then, um, the question in response is, is anything too wonderful for the Lord? I will return. So it seems to me we can read that not as punishment or as scolding, but as calling out and then responding with the promise. Then Sarah denied and said, I did not laugh because she was afraid. And then the messenger said, yes, you did. But the messenger doesn't say, and therefore you are bad. So I think we can read that in a very positive way of calling her out into the into this story, into her full humanity. We have a, that's, that's a great answer. Um, we have another question here is, your dialogue approach leads me to ask, why is the canon closed? Should it be, especially in light of the non-canonical texts and Jesus texts of other faiths? Woo. So <laughs> there are many people who would argue that the canon shouldn't be closed and some folks think the canon is fine just the way it is. Here's what I want to say. Um, God, the God who speaks to us through scripture um, can find us in so many ways. So um, the, the Bible is, in my mind, inspired by God. I believe it to be God's words, and I use that in a plural sense, but that, that meaning, we have to work to uncover the, mean, the meanings in scripture. But I also believe we will find God in surprising places. Thank you. Thank you. Those are, uh, wish we had time for even more, but I think we did get to many of them. The, of the questions. I have one more I want to ask you to comment on, and then uh, we have just a few uh, announcements to share, and then we'll return for just a final word from you, uh, Judy, before we, before we close. Uh, the issue, of course, that's central to all this is uh, uh, Abraham being chosen, Abram being chosen. And then the issue of chosenness continues to appear in all the issues around the patriarchs. And again, you mentioned this in your book. I I recall when I looked at it some time ago. And then what's interesting though, is that not necessarily the most likely person gets chosen. It isn't always the firstborn, which was the tradition. And we should speak a little about chosenness and, and what's the significance of the fact that the most likely person as you've developed, go on with the patriarchs, isn't always chosen. That's a great question. So chosenness is an amazing thing if you're chosen <laughs> and um, a difficult thing if you're not. So I feel like there are a couple of things going on in the Bible. And one of these 
the dynamics is that God's people are telling their story and it's a story of identity. And so it focuses very much on being chosen um, because that is core to the identity of God's people. But we also have, and, and in that tradition, let me say this, God often chooses second born, unlikely, you know, someone without the apparent and obvious gifts is, is the case with somebody like Moses or um, in the ancestral um, period, it's, it's never the firstborn, right? Ishmael is the firstborn, it's Isaac. Jacob is the secondborn. Then Jacob has 12 children and the, the line continues through Judah, who's number three, and God uses Joseph, the next to last, to, to help save um, the known world. So we have these stories that say God always reserves the right to do it in a different way, to do it um, in God's way. Um, having said that about chosenness, the other part is that um, there's more to the story, that in the dynamic of Isaac and Ishmael, for example, we can say God selected Isaac to continue the line of Abraham, but God also makes a promise to Hagar and to Abraham about Ishmael saying he too shall be a great nation. In Amos, the prophet says to the Israelites, um, didn't God also bring up these people? Didn't God also call these people? So this, this, um, this other, this alternate tradition that says um, God has chosen, got the chosenness is not necessarily exclusivity, I think is what I want to say. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we do need to move towards closing here. I want to take just a couple moments and share uh, some announcements and, uh, and then we'll invite Judy to back for some closing uh, comments. Uh, I do want to commend to you again her book, uh, Holy Imagination. It goes through the entire Bible and offers some very interesting, really brief insights about each part of the Bible uh, to help you think about the scripture with a kind of freshness and a, and a new perspective. And I, and I do really commend it to you if you're interested in doing a, a biblical study and looking for aids in, in, in that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, Dr. Fentress Williams with us for two other programs uh, during the summer. Um, and um, you see listed there the dates for these. Um, on a Saturday morning, August 13th, um, she will give a lecture, uh, Dinah and the Shechemite Women, in the subtitle, The Body Politic. Um, and um, we're hoping to do part of that program also in person. It will be a webinar, but we may also develop a, an opportunity for some in-person discussion uh, and, and when that would presentation would take place at the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church. Again, it'll be a, a webinar, but we hope to have some in-person um, presence. Also, we'll be sending you information on that as we get closer to it. And then at the end of the summer, um, September 4th, uh, the Sunday of Labor Day weekend, uh, uh, Dr. Fentress Williams will preach at the 10 a.m. worship service uh, at New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in downtown Washington. And again, all of those services are uh, online now, and you can observe wherever you are in the country. So if you want to uh, hear her preach, uh, it's 10 a.m. Eastern time on September 4th. And again, we'll send information about that. And we invite you to join our worship uh, either in person uh, or online. Um, in addition, uh, we have a couple of other programs for the fall. Uh, that are scheduled. There, there will be others probably this fall, but we have two in our series of author uh, webinars. Um, we have a webinar with Peter Canellos, who has written the book, The Great Dissenter, the story of John Marshall Harlan, America's judicial hero. And if you're not familiar with Justice Harlan, uh, he was a great um, dissenting justice uh, during the latter part of the 19th century, and he spoke out for human rights and civil rights and economic justice uh, in the midst of courts that were ignoring many of those rights. And uh, of course, his was a prophetic voice. The other reason it's of interest to us is that uh, 
uh, Justice Harlan was a, um, a, a many years member of the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church. And so uh, we're very eager and looking forward to hearing this presentation by uh, Peter Canellos on his really lovely book, The Great Dissenter, and that will be on September 21st. We also will have a webinar, a book webinar with Chris Henning, uh, who has um, worked with uh, public defender work and um, worked particularly with youth in Washington, D.C. Chris is a member of the uh, Metropolitan AME Church in downtown Washington, which we partner with on many activities. And uh, we don't have the exact date yet, but Chris will uh, present on her book, uh, The Rage of Innocence, uh, How America Criminalizes Black Youth. Uh, and again, more information about these things will be coming up uh, over the next uh, few weeks. Uh, and finally, just to share our website with you, um, the, um, this is the website for the McClendon Scholar Program on the main church website. Uh, the recording of tonight's program will be up on that website in just a matter of uh, a few days. And recordings of almost all the programs we've had by speakers that uh, Adam mentioned and many others are uh, on that website and you can go and uh, and look at them anytime you want. So I urge you to go in here. Maybe you heard about a speaker we had and you missed the presentation. Uh, we really urge you to do that. Uh, so again, I wanna say, uh, you know, thank you for being here. I wanna invite you to type into chat uh, as we conclude um, uh, anything you wanna share, particularly about an insight you got from the program. Some of you already highlighted some things you found particularly helpful, uh, but take a moment and. And, and share any feedback you have in chat about uh, uh, what you gained, what you learned from this, or any particular um, uh, questions that emerge for you that you wanna share with the group. So again, uh, uh, so glad you're here. We'll keep the chat open for a couple of minutes after we close if you do wanna share some other things. And, um, and now I wanna invite um, Judy Fentress Williams to make any final comments and close our time together. Thank you so much, Theo, for this opportunity to share with you all. And thank you all for um, allowing me to try out this, this line of thought. Um, I hope that as we read the stories of the ancestors, Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and all of their children, that we come away um, knowing that the God that calls them is bigger than what we can understand and that the work of following God is going to require us to stretch out and expand in new and sometimes frightening ways and that all of that outward work and all of that outward movement is accompanied by our growth inside as we grow to receive the promises that God already has for us. And so now I'll conclude with the benediction that I use all the time that um, not surprisingly um, invokes the names of the ancestors. So as we go, may the God of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, the God of Isaac and Rebecca, the God of Jacob and Leah and Rachel, direct your steps, make your path straight, fill your mouths with good things, and lead you to that good and fertile land. Amen and good night. <laughs>